It was Hong Kong in 2011. I was there with my wife doing a little bit of traveling. And when we travel, we like to do a little bit of adventure and dining. And there's no place better for that than China. And so when we were in China, we went to a restaurant that had no English whatsoever. And so you're just looking at this menu and you just, you just point. That's all you can do. You just point to it. And uh, I pointed to this item on the menu. And then eventually I got this bowl this steaming bowl of what looked like meatballs. So, all right, that's a win, something I am familiar with. And so I proceeded to eat the meatballs, but then there was something kind of off. You know, I bit into one, and there's kind of this like jello spew into my mouth, this gelatinous kind of consistency. And I thought, oh, that's kind of weird. So then I uncovered. The, the outside of this breaded ball, and uh, well, it kind of looked like an eyeball. And uh, I still don't know what I ate to this day, but I'm pretty sure it was an eyeball. And uh, <laughs> there's lots of unexpected food in my travels. Here's in Florida, I got to eat some frog legs. Anybody have done that before? This is over by the Everglades. Some lady with no teeth served that to me. And then in Okinawa, Japan, I had rice with uh, squid ink. It was actually quite delicious. In Vietnam, I tasted some of this fermented snake wine. You can get the seven snake or the nine snake version of this snake wine. And then in Beijing, on the streets of Beijing, there's my lovely wife biting into a scorpion on a stick. This particular market has lots of uh, delicacies, as you can see. Sea stars and other stuff like that. <laughs> And then there's a, to wash that down, you could have a, a sip of this sweat drink. I, this was in Hong Kong. I think there's a translation, Google Translate problem there. But a sweat drink. So at the beginning of this trip to Asia, I was all smiles. And then by the end of the trip, I was like that. Lots of unexpected things. And that's what brings us to Exodus 5 and 6 today, is we're going to be talking about something that is unexpected. A little bit of context just to jump into it if you haven't been with us. Moses encountered the living God, Yahweh, in the burning bush at Sinai. And Yahweh gives him a command to go to Egypt and command that his people, the Israelites, be set free from their captivity. Moses is commissioned to go to Egypt and command Pharaoh to let the people of God go. And Moses responds to God's commands with obedience. He obeys, he goes to Egypt. He confronts Pharaoh, but something happens that is unexpected. Earlier on in Exodus chapter 5, we saw that Pharaoh responded to Moses' command by saying, What? Let your people go? I don't think so, buddy. I'm going to make them work harder now. What I will do is make life miserable for your people. I'm going to work them to death. They're going to have the same daily quota of bricks to make for me, but now they're going to have to gather their own material to make those bricks as well. And so the people are in captivity, and it's gotten even worse for them. Moses obeyed God. We know he's in the very center of God's will. And what's the result? His life circumstances temporarily get worse. What a thing. And I wonder if that's ever happened to you. Have you ever taken a step of faith? You knew you were in God's will in doing something, and things just got harder for you. They got worse. They didn't seem to get better. Maybe there's a time you sacrificially gave of your time or your resources to the Lord's work and then you get this unexpected large bill or expense or maybe you get sick or something just doesn't seem to go right from an earthly perspective. This passage this morning begins with an important life principle and that's this. Just because you obey the Lord does not automatically mean your life will be more comfortable. Amen? <laughs> That's not, that one's not going to get a hearty amen, but it is a true statement. Just because you obey the Lord does not automatically mean your life will be more comfortable. And this is what we're seeing as we pick up the text today with Moses. Now, there's a few different reasons that this is true. Sometimes it's simply this is the Lord's way of maturing you in your faith to allow you to go through trials and tribulations Sometimes it's a result of this fallen world, the frustration that we go through as a result of the fall. And other times it's because Satan himself 
is opposing us. John 10.10 says this, The thief, talking of Satan, comes only to steal and kill and destroy. And so the enemy hates us, who are the Lord's, and he doesn't want us to obey God, and so he attacks us, tries to discourage us, tries to destroy us, and make us walk away from our faith. And as we pick up the text this morning, we do see that things get worse for God's people before they're going to get better. Moses obeys God, calls upon Pharaoh to let the Hebrews go, and doesn't look like that's happening anytime soon. But let's just refresh our memory. Look at verse 20 in chapter 5. It reads this way. When they left Pharaoh's presence, they, that is the Israelite people, met Moses and Aaron as they were waiting for them. They said to them, May the Lord look upon you and judge you, for you have made us odious in Pharaoh's sight and in the sight of his servants to put a sword in their hand to kill us. So this is the people's response. They're waiting for Moses and Aaron to come out of their meeting with Pharaoh. And uh, they realize that the work is just going to be harder on them. Pharaoh obviously said no. And so they turn on Moses and Aaron. The people actually blame Moses. They think it's all his fault. And we're going to continually see that. In Exodus, And notice how spiritual they make it sound. They say, may the Lord look upon you and judge you for doing what God told you to do. You know, it's like, what? May the Lord look upon you and judge you. The Israelite people are clearly in the wrong here. And this brings up a truth. Another insight is that no matter what it is, a thousand critics aren't doing it, but they're convinced they can do it better. And Spiritual leaders are often easy targets for criticism. And not all criticism is bad. Don't get me wrong. Sometimes a person loves you for you. They give you the benefit of the doubt. They're walking in humility and they use God's word to correct something in your life. But other times criticism is destructive, like what the Israelites are doing with Moses here. It's not loving. It's not humble. It doesn't give you the benefit of the doubt. Sometimes people just want someone to blast. This is what Charles Spurgeon said on this topic. I call him Uncle Charlie. He's my favorite dead Baptist preacher I quote a lot. Uh, He says this, To opinions and remarks about yourself, turn also as a general rule the blind eye and the deaf ear. Public men must expect public criticism. And as the public cannot be regarded as infallible, public men may expect to be criticized in a way which is neither fair nor pleasant. To all honest and just remarks, we are bound to give due measure of heed. But to the bitter verdict of prejudice, the frivolous fault-finding of men of fashion, the stupid utterances of the ignorant, and the fierce denunciations of opponents, we may very safely turn a deaf ear. It's like, wow, Spurgey, you mad, bro? Uh, But he makes a great point. Don't listen to every critic. And this is what's happening here. We're going to see Moses gets discouraged by these critics in his life. And you can't pay attention to everything people say because sometimes it's just not true. You do need to assess, all right, Lord, is this true? Is this partly true? Remember that Jesus himself had critics and they falsely accused him and nailed him to a cross. And so here we see Moses, he's allowing these critics to discourage him from what he already knows is God's will. He has a crisis of faith. Here, look at verse 22. Then Moses returned to the Lord and said, O Lord, why have you ever brought harm to these people? Why did you ever send me? Ever since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done harm to this people, and you have not delivered your people at all. Now, there are moments in life when God does something or he allows something we weren't expecting, and this causes us to question our faith. And this is exactly what's happening in Moses' life here. And he responds in three ways. We often respond in these ways as well. First, notice that Moses is discontent and he questions God. He says, why? And more than that, he says, Lord, why have you? And he's questioning God directly, pointing the finger at God. And I think this shows us something, that underneath all of his questions, we see that Moses is not okay with the Lord's way of doing things. He believes that he could do a better job, perhaps. And that's the root of all of our discontentment We believe that we could do a better job than God. Maybe there's something we don't have. We think we should have it. If I were God, I would give it to me. Can anybody relate? So many times we obsess over what we don't have or what's not going our way, and we ignore 
what we do have and what's already been done on our behalf. Maybe this is the overwhelming theme of your life, past, present, and future. Think about it. Are you grumbling about your present circumstances, constantly complaining about your job, your marriage, your commute? Could it be that it's not your circumstances that are causing you this discontentment in life, but maybe they just simply reveal that you are discontent? It's a condition of the heart that begins long before your circumstances go sideways. And ultimately, what you're saying in your heart is, hey, God, I think you're getting it wrong. And so that's the present circumstance. Or maybe you're bitter about your past, nursing some kind of bitterness, unforgiveness. You're angry over some pain from the past. You're dwelling on it. And ultimately, in your heart, you're saying, hey, God, you got it wrong. Or perhaps it's your future. You're worrying about the future. You're wrestling with the what ifs. What's going to happen tomorrow? How am I going to make rent this next month? What if I, my health fails? What if I'm not going to be there for my family? All of these what ifs. And ultimately, what are you saying? God, you're going to get it wrong. According to Jesus, Christians should never be paralyzed by worry. That's something that the pagans do, not Christ followers. Listen to his words in Matthew 6, verse 31 through 34. Jesus says, Do not worry then, saying, What will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles... Eagerly seek all these things, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And so here we see Moses, he's discontent, he's questioning God, and furthermore, Moses refuses to believe the promises of God and how they include him. Notice that Moses says, why did you ever send me, God? Why did you ever send me? Now, God already answered this question at the burning bush. And in fact, he restated it a few times and in different ways. God has already answered this, but Moses won't believe him because what he's seeing happen so far doesn't match up with what God has told him. And so he's refusing to believe the promises of God and how he plays a key role in them. And then thirdly, we see that Moses is impatient with God. Look at it again at verse 23. Moses says, Ever since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done harm to this people, and you have not delivered your people at all. All right, I want you to hold up your fingers. How many times has Moses spoken with Pharaoh so far in this encounter? Yeah, just once. <laughs> now notice the tone. He's like, ever since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, you have not delivered your people at all. It's like, Moses, you tried it once, bro. A little bit of patience here, okay? And God already told you that Pharaoh was going to refuse you. But Moses is impatient with God. He's acting like he was there for years, and he's only had one conversation so far. And you know what? That kind of sounds familiar. (laughs) We're all about God's patience with us when we trip up, when we fail, But we're not real fired up about the patience of God when we want him to do something or we expect him to act a certain way. Ah, Man, I prayed for this yesterday. I want it today, God, or else. But 1 Corinthians 13, 4 says this about love. Love is patient. And I think the implications of that statement are this, that if you are impatient with God, you're not really loving God in the way that you should. Maybe you're just using God. And not loving God if you're impatient with him. Maybe he's just a means to an end. Hey God, do what I want you to do and do it now. And now we see the amazing grace of God. Look at the first verse of chapter 6. Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For under compulsion he will let them go. And under compulsion he will drive them out of his land. Notice what it didn't say. It didn't say, Yahweh answered Moses, Who are you to question me, boy? And Moses was killed by Yahweh instantly. No, it doesn't say that. (laughs) Here we see God's grace once again. He's patient with Moses. And he's big enough for his questions, for his doubts, for his temper tantrums. That doesn't mean that God is going to answer how or when Moses wants to necessarily. The same is true for us. It doesn't mean that God is going to answer us how or when we want him to. But believe me, he's big enough to hear us. We can cry out to him 
and he can handle it. Be honest with him about what's in your heart. Now, God patiently reassures Moses here. That's what he's doing. He's just reassuring him of something he already has heard and already should know. The people are in despair. They all think that God has fallen off his throne, but God brings this reassurance. And Moses is going to share this word with the people. Look at verse 2. God spoke further to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord, and I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, Lord, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they sojourned. Furthermore, I have heard the groaning of the sons of Israel because the Egyptians are holding them in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. Say, therefore, to the sons of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from their bondage. I will also redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. Then I will take you for my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you to the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. Remember, the Lord, when we see it in all caps in our scripture, is Yahweh. That's God's personal name. Now, this last week, I was looking at um, some documentaries, and I came upon this, this awesome picture. Do you guys know this picture here? Famous picture. That's D-Day. Now, in the early 1940s, during World War II, Nazi Germany occupied France, and the French people lived under oppression. And as I was thinking about that, I thought of the the similarities between the Egyptian captivity of the Israelites and what was going on uh, with the French people under Nazi Germany. Their food was rationed. They had strict curfews. They had no representation in the government. And then one day, the good news spread that the Allied forces had broken through on D-Day, June 6, 1944. The tide of darkness is going to be pushed back Liberation was coming, deliverance was on the way, and this brought great hope to the people. On that day, British, Canadian, and Americans stormed this beach at Normandy and got a foot into France, and that was a crucial point for them to bring the rest of the military into Europe, laying the foundation for an Allied victory on the Western Front. And in a similar way, God is speaking this beacon of light to his people into the darkness of their captivity in Egypt, he's saying, I'm, I'm starting to work here. I got my foot in the door. Things are going to work out. You will be released from captivity. You will go to the promised land. And in these verses that we just read, I see four characteristics of God. The first is this, that God is sovereign. God is sovereign. What does that mean? That means that he is the ruler of all creation. He's supreme. He's on his throne. Look again at the text. And I want you to notice all the times in those few verses that God said, I am the Lord. I am the Lord. He actually says it four times in this text here. I am the Lord. He's reassuring who he is. Remember, Yahweh, the Lord, means the one who is. Existence, the being one, the ising one. Yahweh. And God brings attention to the fact that in the patriarchal period, that is the days of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he revealed himself to them as El Shaddai. Everybody say El Shaddai. El Shaddai Shaddai is often translated in our scriptures as God Almighty. God Almighty. That's drawing attention to the power of God, whereas Yahweh draws attention to his existence, the fact that he's always there and always has been and always will be. And so here in this passage, we see the two names of God, two of his names, El Shaddai and Yahweh. He's powerful and he's there. He's powerful and he's there. So God is calling attention to his omniscience and his omnipresence and his omnipotence. He knows what he's doing and he's going to work this out. And our response when things go wrong is often like that of the Israelites. Man, God must have fallen off his throne or something. Things are out of control. He can't see me. He can't hear me. He's not going to do anything. But no, this is the same God who says it here, I am the Lord, I'm Yahweh, I'm the one who's there, I'm El Shaddai, I'm the one who's all-powerful. He is on the throne, he is in control, he does see you, he does hear you, he's sovereign. And more than that, God is faithful, God is faithful. Here in this passage, we see God reminding Moses of his unmovable and sure faithfulness 
to his covenant people, to the ancestors of Moses, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all these patriarchs that we read about in Genesis. He made a covenant with them. We saw it in Genesis 12, 15, 17, 28, 35. God is reinstating his promises over and over, and he's faithful to those promises. He promised them a land, the promised land. He promised a seed for them that a great nation would come from the people of Abraham, and we've already seen that taking shape as the Israelites grew under their captivity in Egypt. And he also promised them a blessing. All of those things are still there, still in effect. And what's really cool is this. In Genesis 15, 13 through 14, 400 years of slavery were actually specifically predicted long before the Israelites went there, as was their deliverance from it. Listen to this, Genesis 15, 13 through 14. God said to Abram, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, where they will be enslaved and oppressed 400 years. But I will also judge the nation whom they will serve, and afterward they will come out with many possessions. So God is here saying, this is all coming to fruition. I haven't forgotten what I promised you guys. This is happening, and it's going to happen right now. You guys are going to come out of this slavery. In the text, it says, God, God says, I have remembered and this is an ongoing past tense, something to the effect of, I have been remembering my covenant. So we see that God is sovereign, he's faithful, and that God is a saving God. Salvation is not just what God does, but it flows from who he, he is. He's a salvific God. Now, you notice all the times it says, I am the Lord. Look back in the text and count all the times it says, I will, between verse 6 through 8. How many times does it say it? I want to see if you guys can get that. We got a five. There's more than that. How many times does it say, I will, between verse six through eight? Seven. Yes, yeah, seven times God says, I will. He says, I will bring you out. I will deliver you. I will also redeem you. I will take you for my people. I will be your God. I will bring you to the land. I will give it to you for possession. God is guaranteeing all of these things. I will, I will, I will, I will. And notice what he promises. First, he promises deliverance. No more chains. You guys aren't going to be slaves anymore. Then he promises redemption. Redemption is a word that means to buy back that which was lost or stolen. And then he promises adoption. Notice that God isn't just satisfied with freeing the people. He actually wants relationship and intimacy with his people. He wants to be their father, to have them as his own children, as his very own. And then lastly, God promises inheritance. He says, I've got a land for you guys. You're going to be heirs to a land that I'm going to give to you. And as I was reflecting on all those things that God promised there, these are things that are pointing to something that we have as well. Now, we aren't promised the land of Israel, okay? I'm a Gentile. There's no promise like that for me. But what has God promised us? Well, the same things, deliverance, redemption, adoption, inheritance. Think about it, deliverance. God has promised us Deliverance from the burden and slavery of our sin. We're, we're no longer slaves. We're children of God. We sing that from time to time here at church, and it's true. We're delivered from the burden and slavery of sin. We've also been redeemed, bought back. Listen to this from Colossians 1, 13 through 14. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Furthermore, we've also been adopted by God. Galatians 4, 7 says, Therefore you are no longer a slave but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God, which leads us to an inheritance. We also have an inheritance promised to us. 1 Peter 1, 3 through 4, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. So we've been delivered, redeemed, adopted, and we have an inheritance. Anybody excited about that? How awesome is that? All of that can be yours right now if you put your trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So how do these people respond to these great 
promises of God, these seven I wills and the four I am the Lord's. How do you think the people respond? Let's check it out. Verse 9. So Moses spoke thus to the sons of Israel, but they did not listen to Moses on account of their despondency and cruel bondage. What? They respond in deafness towards God. It says they're despondent, meaning having a broken spirit. And literally, it says that they were out of breath. They were suffocating in their slavery. So they respond in disbelief because of their circumstances. Must be thinking, Moses, man, you're crazy. You don't know Pharaoh. He won't let us go, and he made things worse for us. Thanks a lot. Moses pushes back on God as well. Look at verse 10. Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Go tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the sons of Israel go out of his land. But Moses spoke before the Lord, saying, Behold, the sons of Israel have not listened to me. How then will Pharaoh listen to me? For I am unskilled in speech. And Moses makes a great point here. He's saying, Hey, if my own people aren't going to listen to me, how is Pharaoh going to listen to me, God? But he's forgetting who God is in all of these promises and the fact that God will never make a promise that he won't fulfill. And now, at this point in Exodus, we've seen Moses offer seven distinct objections to God. They're as follows. He says, who am I? What shall I say? They won't believe me. Here he says, I'm unskilled in speech. Earlier we saw him say, just send the message by somebody else. <laughs> just anybody else, God. And then he says, you have not delivered your people at all. So the lack of success at first attempt. And then the sons of Israel have not listened to me. So he's not accepted by his own people. Seven times Moses pushes back on God. So does God smite him? What does he do? No, he gives him grace. God is patient. Look at verse 13. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and to Aaron and gave them a charge to the sons of Israel and to Pharaoh king of Egypt to bring the sons of Israel out of the land of Egypt. This is like the skipping record of God's grace in Exodus. I mean, this is amazing that God is just patiently hearing this all out and he just keeps moving forward with it, Moses and Aaron, and the outworking of his plan. It's ultimately God, not Moses, who's going to bring the people out of Egypt. And this is the last point about God today, is that God is patient. God is a patient God. He persists in his plan to save the people through all these obstacles, through all these objections. He says, you may not believe me now, but you will. Look again at verse 7. He says, I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. So today in Exodus, we've seen a God that is sovereign, a God that is faithful, a God that is saving, and a God that is patient. Surely he deserves our worship, and I hope we worship him for who he is as we respond today with the Lord's Supper and with more songs. But I want to end with this. Do you believe that? Those things about God. Do you believe that he's sovereign, that he's faithful, that he's saving, and that he's patient? Or are you disbelieving like the Israelites? Are you deaf to those truths? Is this message going in one ear and out the other for you this morning? Or are you applying it to your life? And you know what? The good thing is that none of that will stop God. Even if you are hard of heart, even if you are deaf to his word now, he's going to keep pursuing you for as long as you live. He will patiently pursue those whom he sets his mind to save. Maybe today he brought you here to hear this. And my prayer for you is that you would soften your heart and heed the words of the Lord. Know that he wants to save you. He wants to deliver you. He wants to give you an inheritance. He wants to adopt you into his family and forgive all of your sins. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these promises. Lord, that you are God who is patient with us. You're in control. You're God who had purposes to save and deliver us from the, the bondage of our slavery to sin. Father, I pray that if there's anybody in here today who needs to acknowledge you and what you've done for them, that you sent your son Jesus Christ to this earth to die for our sins, that he would go to that cross on our behalf and pay the death penalty for us so that we could have forgiveness and a restored relationship with you. Would they acknowledge their sin before you right now, turn from it and turn to you, bow the knee to Jesus Christ and put their trust in him, the one who died for their sins and rose from the grave on the third day. 
Father, we thank you for who you are and what you've done. Certainly, we have lots to worship you for. And as we now approach the the Lord's table, we remember what Jesus did for us in shedding his blood on the cross for us and allowing his, his body to be beaten for us. As it says in Isaiah 53, by his wounds we are healed. And so we remember him now. We take inventory of our lives. Now as we pass the elements, Lord, we pray that we would remember the great cost with which we were purchased back, with which we were redeemed, and we give you worship as we partake of these together as one family, as your church family has done for millennia now, in unity and in victory, a celebration of what you've done for us. Father, thank you for this time this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.